right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Coltish entering the King of the Colts. My name is Jeremiah Roberts, one of the co-hosts here. I am back. We're back with Eric Johnson. Good to have you back. Thanks for having me on, guys. Awesome. We're here, of course, Andrew, in your super secret headquarters and uh, really loving this set. We're all squished in together. It's a little more condensed than the studio that I'm used to, but I'm really enjoying the time here. So we are talking about your book, which is now available. It's on Amazon. It's on uh, christianbookstores.com. Just tell everyone really quickly about the book and uh, where, yeah, what it's all about real quickly in case you're jumping in. Introducing Christianity to Mormons, a practical and comparative guide to what the Bible teaches, focuses on using the Bible to be able to explain what Christianity is and help Latter-day Saints to get rid of the false stereotypes they might have about what Christianity is. So I'm hoping that this will be a book that will be helpful for Christians, as well as possibly to give it to a Latter-day Saint that they could understand by reading it themselves. Okay, excellent. So we're going to kind of jump into a couple of the chapters uh, in the book, and we're going to maybe the second part of this episode. Just so everyone knows, this is part two of our conversation with Eric Johnson. You definitely check out part one if you haven't already. Really enjoyed that. Uh, Before we jump in... Uh, you said you had some interactions with uh, the late Dr. Walter Martin. Uh, just tell us about that real quickly. Well, he was a hero of mine, as he is apparently to you guys. Uh, Dr. Martin, um, I, I met him for the first time in, and the only time actually, in 1987 when I did a short-term mission in Utah. He uh, he debated a gentleman named Van Hill in Park mm-hmm. City at a hotel there, and the place was packed out. I'll never forget how... He uh, calmly but coolly uh, eliminated the, the, I thought, bad ideas that Dr. Van Hill had. And uh, I thought, you can see this, I think, on the internet. I think mm-hmm. there are tapes of it out there that you can watch the whole debate. But uh, we came away thinking he really did a good job of explaining uh, that Mormonism is, is uh, a cult, if you want to call it that. Mm-hmm. And he had the book, Kingdom of the Cults. So he certainly... Uh, uh, use that word. Uh, but what I'll probably remember even more is that weekend he spoke in a ch- former chapel of Brigham Young right across the street from the uh, state capitol here in Salt Lake City. And it, it was a smaller place, but it was packed with Christians. A, a church at that time had rented that on Sundays, that, that building. And he's a former uh, relative of Brigham Young. He delivered a sermon on Jesus, and I don't think it was taped. I just remember at the time, and I was going to seminary at the time, I thought that is the best sermon I have ever heard on Jesus because he just taught about Jesus as who he really was, focusing on his deity, that Jesus is enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sure wish there was a tape of that. If there was, I I would love to hear that because he actually stopped at the very beginning of his talk, and there was a tear in his eye, and he said, this is a, an important moment for me because I'm a relative of Walter or of, of uh, Brigham Young. And Walter Martin then uh, uh, said, here I am standing in the same place where Brigham Young delivered heresy, and I want to speak to you the truth. Wow. Yeah. Hey, what's up, everyone? Have you ever wanted to get behind the microphone and chat with myself and Andrew, the super sleuth of the show here at Coltish? Well, guess what? You get to do exactly that this October, October 27th through the 29th at ReformCon. It's going to be a great and awesome live conference. There's going to be a lot of great speakers. So if you want to get behind a microphone with myself and Andrew, the super sleuth of the show, go to ReformCon.org. Get your tickets right now, October 27th through the 29th. And can't wait to meet you all there and have a great conversation. Now back to the episode. Yeah, that that's incredible. And I think there's just moments like that. It's always cool to see that. I mean, Walt Martin was very just liturgistic, you know, when he'd pray, he'd pray in King James English, you know, and that was just kind of how, what he would do. I remember, uh, I've listened to it thousands. I, I, in, I don't know if it's in the thousands, but a lot of times it's the dialogue at the doorstep with a Mormon. Mm-hmm. Uh, where it's the back and forth conversation. And at the very end, when they're talking with, uh, they're kind of wrapping it up. And they, I forget the guy's name, but he's sort of, who's portraying the Mormon. Ed Decker. Ed Decker, yes. And they, he's sort of doing the confet, and he starts just to pray towards the, the Lord. But then right before the very, very end, when in, in the, conversation where Ed Decker is about to accept the Lord. He kind of, they almost like break the fourth wall. And it's like Ed Decker goes back to his old self when he first accepted Christ and came out of Mormonism. And then Walter Martin is still like in character, like leading 
him to the Lord. And it's like, you can see Walter Martin, like break the fourth wall. Cause you can only hear the audio, but you can hear Walter Martin, like get, he, he goes from doing this fun conversation with a lot of humor, but he gets very, you can hear him just the emotion behind that when he's telling him to like, to let ask Christ to be your savior. It's so cool. Um, yeah, so let's just jump into it. And I think that's also been just important because we were talking about all of the different aspects of people who are leaving the church, uh, people who don't really know what they believe anymore, people who are jaded because they come out of Mormonism and become atheists or agnostic, people even who are getting sucked into the fundamentalist groups. We talked about that in part one. So there's a lot of categories in your book. And so very, the, one of the very first chapters, you have the introduction, and then you started at the Bible, God's revelation. Why did you start uh, chapter one uh, with the Bible as the foundation? Well, actually, the first two chapters have to do with the Bible. Of the 10 chapters, uh, I wanted to make sure that I gave a good reason for uh, the Bible as being the standard authority for what Christians believe. Because without the Bible or having that authority, I call it God's special revelation, without that, we have nothing but mere opinion. And unfortunately, in Mormonism, Article 8, that was the 13 Articles of Faith created by Joseph Smith, found in the Fairly Great Price, one of the four standard works in the LDS Church, uh, says that the Bible is true only as far as it's translated correctly. I think that's incorrect. First off, translated correctly, I would agree with that. The New World Translation is a horrible translation. Translations can be bad, but they don't mean translated in the sense of one language to the other they mean transmission of the text. And uh, when it comes to the transmission of the text, I think we have very good authority to be able to say that the Bible is God's word and it is true. It's inerrant as it was originally written. And we have very good copies, 5,000 Greek copies, uh, uh, 24,000 in other languages. Uh, we have full New Testaments going back to the fourth century Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrinus, three complete copies. When those three all agree, uh, scholars say that is what the original said. But when we have so many other pieces to be able to work from, and the Old Testament is the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. Those documents that we have from, from these discoveries help us to know that this is a place that is uh, 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 Israel, uh, is the place where these biblical events took place, uh, these are real people that were there, real sites that you can visit today as I take people every year to Israel to, 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 uh, to stand on the actual places where the Bible is, is uh, happening, and then real events. I, I mean, think about uh, the event that took place in the, around 700 B.C. Lachish was destroyed mm -hmm. by the Assyrians. Well, you can go and visit uh, Lachish today and see the ramp built 2,700 years ago. Uh, it's there. The, the story that's talked about in the Bible that uh, Sennacherib went and destroyed, it's there. And then um, King, King Hezekiah built a tunnel, a water tunnel from the Gihon Spring in 1,750 feet. He brought the water into the old city because of what Sennacherib was going to do. And, and so we have that uh, today. Uh, they've rediscovered it in the 19th century. So I think archaeology, along with history, very valuable in helping us to know that the Bible is something that's trustworthy and can be yeah. believed. Yeah, so in, ter in terms of like some apologetics and speaking with your L LDS neighbor, uh, when they even use terms like insofar as it's translated correctly or it's missing many plain and precious parts, how do they shoot themselves essentially in the foot when they try to quote from the Bible? That is a great question, because if you're going to use James 1.5 as the verse that Joseph Smith supposedly read, that uh, he could pray for, uh, for wisdom. I mean, uh, it's not even wisdom that he got. He's looking for knowledge. Is the church true? Is a, is, uh, is, which of the uh, denominations is the true denomination? Uh, what about 1 Corinthians 15.29? That's the one verse that every Latter-day Saint likes to utilize to support the idea that baptism for the dead is true. But if you take away the veracity of the Bible and say, well, I can't really trust it, then you're right. How can you cite these other passages that are not trustworthy either? You can't have it both ways. Mm. That's mm. good. That's good. Let me ask you this too, because you're going through all these evidence, these aspects of evidence, which I think is awesome. 
the, through the lens, though, when you're talking with someone who's Mormon, and I'll just read it just so everyone knows. The anyone who, if you have someone who's a Latter Day Saint, their friend or neighbor, they have the 13 Articles of Faith. Uh, from a very young age, they're taught to memorize these. I remember my classmates were in their seminary class across the street at the high school I attended. They're going through the 13 Articles of Faith. So the th- eighth article of faith of their belief says, "We believe the Bible to be the Word of God." As, so, as far as it is translated correctly, we also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. Um, so when you're presenting these evidences, from a Mormon's perspective, they're still viewing the evidence that you're betraying through the lens of that pre-commitment to the idea of the Bible only being translated correctly. How do you how do you kind of get past them because them weighing the evidence? They're kind of playing judge with the evidence you're presenting them. Or give us some examples of what conversations actually look like when you're bringing up the authority of the Bible, reliability of the Bible. As I said on the first part of the show, I uh, uh, the last show, I, I don't believe that many Latter Day Saints really understand Article Eight, and so I like to mm. ask them, "Can you please explain?" To me, when you just said that the Bible is true as far as it's translated correctly, what do you mean by that? They start to tell me, well, you know, corrupt priests that came in and they added and subtracted things, and we can't really know what was said. And so the plain and precious parts you mentioned, uh, you know, we can't really depend on the Bible. And I say, well, can I help you understand that that's not translation? You're talking about transmission. How do you think the Bible was transmitted. How did it get to us? Mm-hmm. Over and over <laughs> again. I, I like to ask questions, and I'll say, yeah. do you even know what languages the Bible were written in? Latin is oftentimes the answer. Well, no, no, it was Koine Greek in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it was Hebrew and some Aramaic. Uh, but how did it get transmitted to us? Well, uh, one guy actually wrote something down and then the next guy, he writes the same thing down. And then, you know, and, um, and it's kind of like the telephone game. And I actually talk about the telephone game. I think it's in chapter two yeah. that they say, well, you know, it, it obviously gets distorted as from one person to the next. And they almost think it's, a, it's an oral type of thing that's going on here. No, it's written down. These are the, certainly there is copying that's going down, but it's written down so that we can go back and see the previous one. And sometimes there are some glitches. There's no doubt about it. What do we do? We go to the earliest, most accurate manuscripts. When we have different passages, the the scholars have put those together. You can actually purchase Mm -hmm. a copy of the Greek New Testament, and it has ratings of the different possibilities, the variants. But if you listen to a guy like Bart Ehrman, misquoting Jesus. And by the way, Latter-day Saints like to quote Bart Ehrman all the time. Right. That doesn't make any sense. He's an atheist. He doesn't like the Bible. Why are you quoting uh, Why are you quoting a guy that will use the telephone game and other things like that to try to disparage the yeah. Word of God? If the, if the Bible is worthy to be studied, uh, and I believe it is, 2 Timothy 3.16, that says that all Scripture is inspired. Which Scripture is he referring to? He's obviously referring to the Old Testament, but if you keep reading in the verse, I think it's 18, it talks about talk, it talks about the Scripture referring to Jesus. Well, I, uh, it's obvious to me that the, the New Testament apostles knew they were writing Scripture. 2 Peter 3.16, Peter said that Paul's writings were very hard to understand, but they were Scripture. So if these guys understood that they were writing scripture, then this is what God's word was. Do we have the autographs? We don't. Latter-day Saint, do you have any autographs of, let's say, the Book of Mormon? Any of the books there? No, the plates were all taken. So we don't have the autographs there. Mm -hmm. Does that affect your understanding of the accuracy of the Book of Mormon? And they'll say, I mean, they don't have, let's just be honest, they do not have... Uh, an Article 8 for the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is true as far as it's translated correctly. They ought to because there have been several thousand changes since it was first printed in 1830. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to be trying my best to ask questions to see what they know about the process. And then I have citations, and I included one in the book here, of LDS writers, uh, uh, academics, who say the, the Bible is 99 and 44 100 pure. They actually have said that yeah. in conferences, and it's like, yeah. okay, so what? This guy seems to be pretty knowledgeable, and uh, so you know. And then they like to also point out contradictions. My, whenever they bring that out, 
what do you do? You ask the question, mm -hmm. which contradictions are you referring to? And then they'll oftentimes give you one. And I always like to ask the question, well, is that the best you have? If I'm able to answer that, then will you believe the Bible is mm -hmm. accurate and true? Yeah. Well, no, then I won't answer them. Just yeah. as Jesus said, you know, he, he did the same kind of thing. And he says, neither will I answer you because pearls before swine. And I'm not saying Latter-day Saints are swine. I love Latter-day Saints. Otherwise, I wouldn't have moved to Utah. Yeah. Uh, at, at the same time, I think it's unfair that they want to disparage the Bible when, as you pointed out earlier, Andrew, uh, they're using the Bible whenever it suits their purposes. They just <laughs> right. don't like a lot of the things that it says that contradict what they believe. Right. I mean, we have the autographs, too, of the Book of Breathings, the papyri that supposedly Joseph Smith <laughs> translated into yeah, the Book of Abraham, that's, that's and he was 110% incorrect with every single little translation that he made. So. Yeah. The church yeah. admits to that in the Gospel Topics essay mm -hmm. that was printed, I think it was 2015, that's found on their church website. Uh, that it's a spiritual translation. Well, you can do anything. And the Book of <clears throat> Moses, same thing. I mean, they don't even have a manuscript to go with the Book of Moses. Right. That just came out of his mind. Well, if you think that a man has such power to translate something that says something completely different, common funeral papyri, and you're able to create doctrine out of it, because Mormons do get doctrine out of the Book of Abraham and the, and the Book of Moses as well. They're doing a come follow me um, it's, it's, it's a, um, it's a study that the Mormons do weekly. And so this year they're studying the old Testament. They took the first five weeks of this and studied the first 11 chapters of Genesis. I mean, we're talking only a one year program, five weeks, 11 chapters of Genesis. And then they also included 10 chapters from Abraham and Moses as part of a study on the old Testament well, it has no manuscript evidence. Talk about having nothing to support yourself with. I have a problem with that because they're including the idea and then the gods. They, they, they make right. God into plural. Well, mm. where does the idea that there are true gods, multiple gods? It's not found in the Bible. It's found in um, the Pearl of Great Price. Wow. And, and, and it bothers me, too, when they say it was a spiritual translation. I mean, if you look at the 1843 Times and Seasons, where the Book of Abraham was first published, in very big, bold, black letters, all caps, it says a translation by Joseph Smith. Right. It doesn't say a spiritual translation. It says a translation. And there's even copies of uh, some of his writings of how he uh, supposedly took characters and then wrote them into whole sentences or whole paragraphs. I mean, to me, that doesn't seem like a spiritual translation. It seems like he really tried. It's just trying to save face. But one thing I hear on the street all the time, maybe you can talk about this, is the concept of the Trinity, right? I hear it all the time. They go, well, such is, it's, it's such a confusing, a hard topic for some of them to wrap their heads around since they have God reinterpreted to them through uh, manly ways that they can grasp. But when they hear something about the Trinity, in the beautiful infiniteness of God, they think it's just too complicated to be true. Hey everyone, if you are watching us right now on Apologia Studios' YouTube channel, you need to know that Cultish would not be possible if it wasn't for this studio. So if you want to support Apologia Studios, which also makes Cultish a possibility for you to enjoy every single week here on YouTube, go to apologiastudios.com. You can become an all-access member, and you will also get a lot of great additional content, which will also help support the studio, which will allow Cultish to be a possibility as well on a weekly basis. So we thank you all for watching us, and now back to the episode. Well, and, and this is the thing about God. He is transcendent. Mm. He is above our thoughts. Uh, the Bible says that my ways are not your ways. And I think what the Latter-day Saint wants to do is take God and put him into a box and be able to say, here is our God. Here is our view of salvation. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? We have the answers to this. But I think if you ask a Latter-day Saint uh, if he has all the answers, he will admit he doesn't by asking the question, do you believe the couplet by Lorenzo Snow, as man is, God once was? That's the first half. The second half is, as God is, man may be. Do you believe that first half? And they go, yes. I said, okay, so let me get this straight. Do you believe that God was once a human being on another realm, another world, if you will? Oh, yes, mm -hmm. I do. Okay, so can you explain to me, you know, was he a sinner? Oh, we find most Latter-day Saints will say, yeah, he had to have been a sinner, I guess. They haven't thought about it, but I guess he must have been. 
Whoa, that is huge because so God was once a sinner. He had to die, they say. Well, yeah, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. So that's quite incredible. Can you tell me a little bit about the God he worshipped? And what about that God? And what was his God that he worshipped? In fact, can you help me to understand where the first God came from? And you know what they'll say? Well, that goes way beyond my pay grade. I, I don't know. That's kind of a mystery. Oh, okay. So when it comes to mystery, you have a mystery. You don't have all the answers. Your God that supposedly was all in a box, uh, there's a lot of mystery. We don't know who, who he is. And, uh, you know, so I think when you bring that out to a Latter-day Saint and help him to understand that if he has a mystery, I think we're allowed to have mystery. And I think it's appropriate because the minute you think you have God all figured out, who becomes omniscient? Right. You become the mm. omniscient one. Mm, God cool. is yeah. the one who has been figured out. And so I don't think we can fully grasp him. We can get his, we can understand the major characteristics of who he is, but we'll never fully understand his mind or his nature. These are mysteries that will be, I think, unveiled to us in, in heaven. Yeah. What do you think about the claims of, the Bible being put together by Constantine, Constantine or assembled at the Council of Nicaea. Do you see those claims still being made by folks who are LDS? I, I remember hearing that a lot. Uh, not not lately, but in college, it was a big, big thing. Maybe it was around, maybe because of the Da Vinci Code, yeah. but that was a big thing. And the, what about you? I think you still see uh, that idea uh, because when the Trinity gets brought out, you know, then they're, the, the, oftentimes they'll say, oh, that was from... Uh, pagan background, the, the Greeks and the Romans and all of the rest. And, and so I say, can you pinpoint that for me? And usually mm -hmm. they like to say, well, there was, there was like this council. They don't know when it was. It was 325, yeah, 325. AD 325, Council of Nicaea. Uh, and so then I'll say, and I'll say, well, the Council of Nicaea? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Okay, so what happened at the Council of Nicaea? Let them explain to you what they know. Well, they'll usually explain to you that they don't know what the Council of Nicaea was about because either they'll say, well, that's where they put together all the books of the Bible, or they'll talk about how the Trinity was created and that's where so much heresy came in, you know, because soon after the death of the apostles, the great apostasy, there is no more authority on this earth. So, so that's what they'll say. I'll say, no, that's not what was, they had nothing to do with the books of the Bible. That gets taken care of. As far as the Old Testament, we accept what the Jews did at the Council of Jamnia between 90 and 120. Uh, we accept that what we have is 39 books. They actually have is 22, but the same mm -hmm. books are there. So we've never really debated the Old Testament. As far as the New Testament, uh, we've had going into the third century all the way through the fourth century, and it was finalized at 397 at the Council of Carthage. But the Council of Nicaea had nothing to do with that. It had nothing to do with creating the Trinity. Rather, they were dealing with the issue, uh, is Jesus a created being or is he God in the flesh? That was what 325 bishops uh, did at that council. It was a very important council because it eliminated what's called Arianism. A guy named Arius was the heretic. And Jehovah's Witnesses today are followers of Arius, if you will. They're true Arians in the belief that Jesus is not God. No, the Bible teaches he is both God and man, and uh, we call it the hypostatic union, 100% God, 100% man. Latter-day Saints don't believe that Jesus is fully God in the same sense mm -hmm. that Heavenly Father is, so we have a problem with our view on who God is. That's so good. And what can you clarify to uh, a lot of fundamental misunderstandings as well is with scripture in general, people think that there's men who authorize what is in scripture or what is the canon in general, but there's simply more of a recognition of what was already there. Can you explain that a little bit more too? Yeah, they, I mean, there was a guy named Athanasius who was involved at the Council of Nicaea and uh, he came up with a list in the 350s of the 27 New Testament books. And these are the same 27 books that had been talked about earlier in the third century, there, there was some debate. I mean, there, there was a debate about uh, some of the pastoral uh, epistles. Uh, we, I think Peter, you know, second Peter, I think um, w was discussed uh, second and third John um, James, you know, the, the, there was some issues with that, but overall th they came together and they just said, this is the list that's authoritative. 
And like I said, it was finalized in Carthage in 397. Um, uh, council, what was the other council? I forget the name of it, but they, they did have discussions to try to figure this out. And uh, listen, I mean, what other books should be in the New Testament canon? I mean, I ask a Latter-day Saint, well, you know, should some of the Gnostic Gospels, there are some who would advocate for that, but that doesn't really co- correspond with mm-hmm. Mormon teaching. Uh, what books should have been left out? I mean, the book that they might have left out was the the book of James, that's one of their favorite books to go to. So I don't think they want to get rid of the book of James. And and, uh, so, uh, you know, scholars have looked at this even in the 21st century, and they would agree those 27 books were meant to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I appreciate that. And this is really, really good. If anyone wants to get the full book, you can look at the chapters. That specific chapter in your book is very, very good. And again, we're talking about your book, Introducing Christianity to Mormons, which is now available uh, for sale or over Amazon, uh, Christian, is it? Christianbooks.com. Christianbooks.com. And you could definitely check that out. I So chapter three is called The Existence of God. And I want to maybe just tap into my immediate gut reaction when I just saw that title. Mormons, they believe in God. They believe in the existence of God. They just have a different concept concept than Christians. They believe that God is an exalted man who has a body of flesh and bone. But why would you need to talk to Mormons about the existence of God? Why and I, that chapter? I knew that people would say that. And so in the beginning, I actually talk about why this chapter in a book that's supposed to be introducing Christianity to Mormons. And the reason why is Jana Reese's book, The Next Mormons from 2019, said that 45% of people who leave the church go to atheism, agnosticism, or nothing at all, much more than they would go to the Christian church. And I talked to a lot of these folks. I have talked to hundreds of people who have left who have become atheists. And, uh, and so I think if we're talking to people who are interested, who are willing to hear what we have to say about Christianity, it's probably because maybe they're doubting as a Mormon, and they're not a true blue is not going to read this. We call them true blue Mormons, TBMs. That they're not going to want this book. They're not going to want to talk about this issue with you. Anti literature, yeah, anti Mormon. I don't like that term because a Mormon is a is a name for a person who's a believer in Mormonism. I'm not against the Mormon. I'm against the ism. So call me anti Mormonism. <laughs> mm-hmm. But funny. but but we have we have this problem of trying to. Um, understand uh why the latter-day saint is um is uh he he struggled so so i'm not going for the true blue mormon who would not read this book i am wanting to uh, uh to reach the person who is either thinking about leaving or who has left and realizing very likely they're going to deny god they're going to have that moment I, I asked the Latter-day Saint who has left, uh, okay, so help me to understand, you don't believe in God anymore? And, and, they, and they say, well, no, I don't. I said, well, why? And they said, well, this religion burned me out. Well, here's the problem. Religion is about man, man's attempt to reach God. I said, yes, you were burned, and I apologize for that. It shouldn't have happened. And yet for how many years you were in this church, you were told that this was true, and now you realize it's not true. But didn't you once believe in God? Didn't you once believe Jesus was your Savior? And you know what they say? Oh, yeah, I did. I said, so what happened? Again, it's the religion. I said, but you know what? God and Jesus did not do that to you. It was men who did that to you. And if you end up not believing in God at all, I think they have the last laugh because, in essence, many Mormons, I think, act as if they are atheists. Uh, and and so I think it's a religion that breeds atheism. If you uh, are somebody who's going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, I think you're making a tragic mistake. And the idea that many Latter-day Saints encourage each other by saying, if the church isn't true, then nothing else is, I say, that's a lie from Satan. Where did you get that from? Well, we used to say it to each other all the time as, mm-hmm. as uh, Latter-day Saints. I said, well, think about it. If the church isn't true, then nothing else is. That's going back to the great apostasy. Do you hold to the great apostasy being true? Well, I don't know. Well, do you hold that Joseph Smith was a true prophet because he was the one who taught that? Well, no, I don't like Joseph Smith. I said, well, he's the one that taught that there was a great apostasy. Mm -hmm. Well, I just haven't really thought it through that way. Well, if the church possibly was lying to you, I think they were lying to you that if the church isn't true, then nothing else is. 
well, um, maybe you need to consider the possibility that something else is true. It could be atheism. It could be Buddhism. It could be uh, biblical Christianity. And until you do the investigation, I did the investigation when I was a junior in high school and I found out that Jim Jones had a thousand people drink poison Kool-Aid. I said to myself, how do I know that I'm not part of a, of an heir? So I went out reading other scriptures, talking to as many people as I could. And that's where I gathered my love for people who believe in other religions. I find it all fascinating, as I'm sure you guys do as well. People believe some really interesting things. I want to get into their minds and their heads, and I want to find out why do you believe that? Mm -hmm. And then I want to take a look at what best corresponds to reality. That's good. So so why is it then so important to understand the existence of, it's not just God in general, but the God of the Bible? Like, why is that important? Well, if the Bible is true, then we would have to say that it is teaching the truth about who God is. It's quite simple. That's why the first two chapters on the Bible, because (laughs) if the Bible is not true, then I guess it's everybody for himself. And we try to look at the uh, um, empirical evidence to see, okay, what is truth? This is the question that uh, Pilate asked uh, Jesus at this trial. What is truth? K. Veritas. And, and I think that's the best question anybody today can ask. Is the Bible true? I think it is. If the Bible is true and it teaches in a God who's one God, Deuteronomy 6 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is a God, is one. Uh, the idea that uh, God is. It doesn't know of any other God, Isaiah 43, 10. Isaiah 44, 6 and 8 says that God knows of no other gods. That's pretty clear. Mm-hmm. If you read 43 through 46, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the idea of a monotheistic God is ver- very much makes sense, that God doesn't change, Malachi 3, 6, that uh, God is from everlasting to everlasting, Psalm 90, verse 2. And in fact, if you go to the Book of Mormon, which is supposed to be the most correct book on earth, and a man supposedly can get closer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. Well, Mosiah 3.5 and Moroni 8.18 both say that God has always been God. When was there ever a time for him to have been a man so mm. that he could have, uh, and, and the idea that he changed in his being from a sinner to somehow a holy God, and that I have the potential to become God makes no sense. So I don't know, that's a long answer to your question, but But to go around the corner and say, well, what else do I have if I don't have the Bible to tell me what is true? Is it God's Mm. special revelation or it's not? If it is, then we need to trust it. If it's not, then help me to understand how am I supposed to determine truth? Yeah. Yeah. No, that that, that is so good. I appreciate that so much, Eric. And I I think, honestly, like one of the most practical tactics you can really do and then it goes totally along with everything that you've written in your book again the book is called introducing christianity to mormons it's available for sale now we have links in our description is really believing what god says about the unbeliever and what what the apostle paul says in roman chapter one is that every single person they know that god exists uh, but they suppress the truth and unrighteousness and i always say to ex-cultists not just mormons but who've had, say, a traumatic experience, whether it's just having that doubt, really having your whole world fall apart, but a lot of it, a lot of times comes with trauma, uh, severance from people that are close and family members. You, actually, let me ask you this. I just thought of something. You mentioned earlier in the book, you were saying that when you, you need to realize when talking to people who are LDS, that you need to realize that they're, they're, what if they come to believe this, it's going to come at a cost. So there's a weight and gravitas even behind this conversation. Real quickly, talk about that. If a person leaves their church, they could be risking their marriage. They could be risking their children. They could be risking their stand in society. They are making a very big decision. So this is a hard thing for people who leave. And some would say maybe they ought to just stay in the church. And many do. There are many atheists and many non-believers who go to the church who do that to keep peace in the family. But uh, I think we as Christians need to be appreciate that because I never yeah. was a Latter-day Saint. You guys weren't either. And so we don't quite get that. But to understand the ramifications of leaving, when I present to them the gospel and they accept it, 
they are, wow, what are they going to do mm. now, now that they have this information? And I don't suggest they do stay in the church because they're not going to get fed there. They're not going to have the ability to have oversight in a church situation that I think the Bible wants us to have. Uh, somebody who believed in uh, Diana uh, didn't keep going to the Temple of Diana. They, you know, they stopped. They, they would join, you know, with the Christians uh, or what, you know, if it was in the Old Testament, it would be the Jews. And, and then later it became the Christians. I, I think we... Um, I think we need to present the truth, and if, if uh, a person wants to leave Mormonism, uh, then we're going to have our work cut out for us to help them to be able to transition out. But I'm going to say, if you're a Latter-day Saint and you're somebody who's scared about leaving, it's the best thing you can ever do. And to have a relationship with Jesus compared to what you had as a Latter-day Saint, not knowing if you have eternal life, if you were to die right now, most Latter-day Saints say, I don't know if I would end up in the celestial kingdom. But in the Bible, it teaches us, 1 John 5, 13, that we may know we have eternal life. There's that promise. And so if you want, I will help you. As a Christian, we need to be willing to do that. You guys have discipled people. You know, mm-hmm. we, we have taken people and 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 hold their hand. And uh, once they understand what it's all about, they, they have a desire. I, I have friends that yeah. I help desire. And, and I know that if I were to ask them, now, would you like to go back to Mormonism? They would say, don't even talk that way because, because I did not have any hope in that church. Now I have a relationship with Jesus and Jesus mm-hmm. is enough. Yeah. I mean, it's such a stark contrast when you look at people who are in that category that Jesus is everything to them versus the Mormon Stories podcast. Yeah. Um, and again, this is not to take shot, uh, take take shots or diss anyone. There's just the reality that that when you leave and you don't really have any, anything to replace it with, your identity is based on the fact that you are an ex Mormon and you have this identity that now you're still struggling what to replace it with. And there's a lot of jadedness, a lot of bitterness, and it just goes to show that you have to be able to replace the counterfeit with an original. So to paraphrase what I was going to mention earlier, the existence of a counterfeit predicates the authenticity of an original. And because God has put eternity in the hearts of men, when people have experienced a counterfeit, they become jaded. But we know when we're talking to someone, he's either say an ex Mormon in that category. We know that they believe that God exists and they're still, even though they're still, still suppressing the truth, they have a longing. They have longings that only can be fulfilled in the triune God. And we know that's what God says about the unbeliever. So I know that whenever I talk to someone who's ex LDS, I know that's what God says about that. I'm not going to derive from that. Um, did you have any kind of last thoughts on that before we jump on to maybe the next section? Or are you, are you gonna... No, go ahead. I, I got some yeah. thoughts on that uh, personally. I think it's amazing uh, how Jesus describes himself in Scripture. Like in John, we see him quoting in uh, many of the I am statements from Isaiah, actually, with the Annie who words from the Septuagint. Uh, and what's beautiful about that is Isaiah 43.10. It says, literally in the beginning, it says, so that you may know, understand, and believe that I am he, mm. right? And Jesus then quotes from Isaiah 43 in John when he's giving prophecy to the disciples. But what's amazing is that God wants us to know, understand, and believe who he is. And if you're speaking to someone who's LDS and you present them with the Jesus Christ of Scripture and the beauty of what he did in his death, burial, resurrection for their sins, paying the penalty of their sins on the cross— Jesus becomes more beautiful than anything in their lives. But the Amen. only way to have that happen is when you're actually preaching through the Jesus Christ of Scripture. So the existence of the God of the Bible, who is Jesus, who is the Father, who is the Holy Spirit, is what shows the beauty in the relationship of what it even means to be human in general. So you're willing to give up everything that you have <laughs> to truly understand what it means to exist as God's creation, right? Yeah, I agree completely. Amen. Well, well said. Yeah, so... Just real quickly, we've had plenty of conversations too, and Walter Martin always talked about when when it really comes down to what it's really all about, and I remember this from Dialogue at the Doorstep with a Mormon uh, between Ed Decker and Walter Martin. He goes, well, if, well, whenever I ask, whenever I get into the discussion of Christianity religion, the one thing I always want to know is what do you think of, what do you think of Christ? 
Because that's really where really where it's at. Then, Whose son is he? And for me, I really want to know what you think <laughs> about Jesus Christ. I'm living. <laughs> I've watched this so many times. Like I have have the way in which you said it. Yeah. But when we're talking to someone who's LDS, we Jesus bring up who Jesus is is a, is a fundamental importance because there's so many different rabbit trails you can go down. You can talk about temples. You can talk about undergarments. You can talk about the Mountain Meadows Massacre, you can go You can go into all different areas, but what do you think is important to talk about Jesus and when it comes to LDS, and what, what do you think you, was important to, to you enough in regards to that that you wanted to bring up in this book? Well, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, 4, it's possible to have a false Jesus. The idea that just because you hold Jesus in your church's name, as the missionaries like to point to their badges, doesn't mean anything if the version of Jesus that you're advocating is not true. And, uh, I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Muslims believe that uh, Jesus is one of the great prophets. Peace be upon him, they'll say. Uh, the My Hare Krishna friends will say that Jesus is a great guru, but these are all false versions of who Jesus is. And the Bible says in Galatians 1, 8, 9, that if anybody preaches a gospel other than the one I preach to you, let him be accursed. So we, we see very clearly that it's possible to have Jesus in your religion, but if it's not the right version of Jesus, Jesus in Christianity, it's in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. John chapter 1, verse 1. Who is the word who was God? Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We believe that Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. We believe that that's called the hypostatic union, uh, 100% of each. Jesus being in very nature did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, Philippians chapter 2. We can go through the Bible and we can get a really good picture of who Jesus is. Well, who is Jesus according to Mormonism? Jesus according to Mormonism is a created being of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, firstborn, so he, that's the term that uh, is in the Bible, so they'll use that term, firstborn. They mean that literally. Yeah. Lucifer followed. Uh, there was this great council in heaven, and Lucifer and Jesus disagreed on their plans. Uh, and then all of us really are brothers and sisters of Jesus. Imagine that. We all came from the same stock. Heavenly Father was our parent as well. And that Jesus somehow came into the, uh, uh, somehow he perfected himself without having to go through mortality. I always like to ask that question. How come he didn't have to go through mortality? And I do. Yeah. What did he do that was so special? Because, you know, I mean, so he was perfect in the preexistence. And so therefore he gets a free pass. And, and, uh, and then when did he accomplish uh, uh, perfection? Some would say when he uh, was on the cross and that's where he, uh, uh, he, he got his perfection there. No, Jesus was perfect from the very beginning, according to the Bible. So when it comes to Jesus, I like to ask the Latter-day Saint, tell me more about your Jesus. And they'll, mm. they'll tell me about how he's their savior. Well, what's he your savior of? What, what, what does that mean? Savior? Always ask that question. What do you mean by, and, and they'll say, well, you know, through the atonement and through the grace. And I, I, well, you have to understand the language that's being talked about in Mormonism is different. The, the terms are the same, but the meanings are different. Well, what does a Mormon mean when he says, I believe I'm saved by grace, that the atonement saves me? That is called immortality. That's general salvation. Everybody gets that because supposedly we were all spirits in a preexistence, previous life, and we don't remember it, but we chose Jesus' plan over Lucifer's. So uh, they'll say, well, we believe in salvation by grace, um, and, and, and that's what they mean. But that's not the same as what Christianity is, because the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we're saved by grace through faith. This is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. So it's it's this uh, idea that, that uh, we are able to receive uh, salvation based on uh, on grace and Mormonism, it's not just grace; it's your individual works. Um, you're supposed to keep the commandments of God continually, and unless you do, where I am, you cannot go. That's what God supposedly said in Doctrine and Covenants, section twenty-five, verse fifteen. This is what they call exaltation. This is what they believe is celestial kingdom uh, or eternal life. But the Bible teaches that we may know we have eternal life. First John mm -hmm. five thirteen. 
Eternal life, that's the same term that's used for exaltation. Latter-day Saints don't know they would have that. Hey, what's up, everyone? We love that you are enjoying our content on a weekly basis, but this program cannot continue and wouldn't be possible without your support. So if you want to go to thecultistshow.com, there is a donate tab. You can either support us one time or you can become a monthly partner with us that will allow us to continue this program, allow us to continue to be salt and light to the kingdom of the cults. So please go to thecultistshow.com forward slash donate and you can support us one time or monthly. Also, make sure you check out our merchandise store. Go to shopcultish.com. You can see all of our great designs. A lot of you have, have gotten merchandise from us already. So again, you either go to shopcultish.com and check out all the awesome merch. Back to the show. So practically speaking, I've noticed when you bring up something that a couple uh, when I first started two decades ago when I'm in high school, talking about how Jesus and Satan are brothers. They're an open book about it. I have no problem with it. And then you can have a conversation. Yeah. Colossians 1, 15, 15 through 17, how Jesus Christ created all things, including including Satan. It seems that that has had a minimum, continues to have more, less of a, an effect. The effect on that becomes a lot more minimal just because they're postmodern. Either they're postmodern and they don't understand their own doctrine or they just are indifferent or don't care. Like, how do you, what do you, what are you seeing come up now when it comes to Jesus and even those arguments or how, how do you effectively communicate this to a Mormon for, so they can understand that there's a terminology difference? What does that look like in your perspective? Yeah, I think for a lot of Latter-day Saints in this postmodern idea, especially the younger uh, Latter-day Saints, they're no longer a people of the book. And, and by that, they have four scriptures. They have the Bible, the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. And yes, they study that in seminary in high school. Uh, every high school here in Utah has a seminary nearby, and they're studying these things. There's no doubt about it. But when it comes to what they rely on for truth, we talked about this in the previous show. It's all about personal revelation, what it is that I feel. And I think for many uh, Latter-day Saints, uh, unfortunately, we can use our Bible, and it won't really have an effect on them. But then I have to understand that I am not going to be able to convince someone with my words. It's going to have to be the Holy Spirit who comes in and takes over. So when, when, it, when, I, uh, when I'm in a conversation with somebody and they're just coming out with things that really are not what Mormonism teaches. They come up with their own uh, ideas. I always like to say, well, where do you get the basis for being able to believe the way that you believe versus the way that, I mean, I, I know what Mormonism teaches and that's not what Mormonism teaches. And I know what Christianity teaches. It does not teach anything close to that. So trying to, uh, Trying to work. This is all kind of a puzzle, I would say. Mm-hmm. Trying, to, yeah. trying to. Uh, each person is an individual, and, and uh, but I think we are coming more to this idea that, you know, in the progressive nature, it's just what I believe. And who are you to tell me I'm wrong? That would be very mm-hmm. uh, unkind of you to say that my ideas are wrong. When well, I, I am. I'm saying that your idea does not consistent either with your religion or with the Bible itself. So how do you, um, with modern uh, LDS apologetics, like going down to Provo, I hear this all the time. Like we do believe in the same type of grace. It is by grace and faith. I only do the commandments because I have love for God. It's not that they saved me. I always try to remind them about like, well, what's article three say, you know, things like that. Cause it's, we believe that all mankind may be saved through the atonement of Jesus Christ by obedience to the gospel ordinances mm. and principles. But there seems to be this disconnect ever since this uh, LDS teacher, Brad Wilcox has yeah. like really blurred the lines between uh, what they actually truly hold to in their doctrine in terms of a works based salvation. Can you kind of explain that? Like how can we break that, that barrier in a sense? If you take a, closer look at what Brad Wilcox teaches and you can go to our website, mrm.org. We've done podcasts on him. Uh, he just spoke at general conference last year, very popular speaker, but he really is not saying anything different than what Mormonism teaches. You have to look closely. It sounds like oftentimes they, they love to come up with these little catchphrases and, uh, people gravitate toward that. Jeffrey R. Holland, for instance, a few years ago said, you get credit for trying. 
And a lot of Mormons were telling me on the street, well, I get credit for trying. But you read his talk very closely. He's not saying that you're going to get the celestial kingdom. It just means you get credit for trying, but you got to keep going until you actually do what you're supposed to do. How many command? Here's what I ask. Uh, how many commandments are you supposed to keep as a Latter-day Saint? You know what their answer is? Mm-mm. All of them. Mm. How often? All the time. Yeah. How are you doing at that? Mm-hmm. And, and because... Uh, Doctrine and Covenant, section one, says, For I, the Lord, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. Nevertheless, he that repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be forgiven. So while a guy like Holland or a guy like Wilcox can come in and make it sound like we're really that close, no. In fact, why is it every time I like to cite Ephesians 2, 8, 9, I'm sure you guys like that verse as well. Mm, You cite that verse, where do they go? What's the first thing? Faith that works is dead. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. James chapter 2, verse 20. Checkmate. Have you thought about Yeah. And, <laughs> and I, I always say, well, I agree with James. Well, if you agree with James, then you don't agree with Paul. Oh, no, no, no. I agree with James because what is he saying? He's saying, if you say you have faith, then good works will follow. The Bible teaches that all over the place. Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit is obvious. Love, joy, peace, patience, etc. The Bible says in Romans 8 that a Christian has the Holy Spirit in him uh, or her. And and that's the one who does the work in your life. Uh, I mean, I I like to go back to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, right where it says, not by works, lest any man should boast. What part do you not understand? But verse 10 goes on after he just says that, and it says, for we are God's workmanship created by Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. uh, James and Paul, therefore, were on the same page. Before we were even created, God created us to do good works, and it's yet the justification by faith alone. Uh, Romans chapter 5 says we're, we're justified by faith apart from works of the law. Read the book of Galatians. Had a Mm -hmm. powerful impact on Martin Luther. Uh, That's where sola fides comes from. Right. Uh, You know, going back to those passages. But in Mormonism, they have a verse, and they all know the verse, 2 Nephi 25, 23. Mm -hmm. You're saved by grace, what? After After all all you can do. do. How many times have you heard that on the street? Um, And you say, so how much can you do? Well, I can do a lot. Uh, So how are you doing at that? Well, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm trying, or I'm doing my best. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a minute, let me understand. What does try mean? Try means you didn't do what you set out to do. What does it say in 1 Nephi 3.7? 1 Nephi 3.7 says that God does not give commandments that cannot be kept. And by the way, notice, I like to cite their verses. I don't cite them exactly. I just give the gist of it. I think if we can learn those verses from their own scriptures, I think it has a powerful effect. They all know 1 Nephi 3.7, and they go, yeah, but I'm trying. Well, you know what Spencer W. Kimball said about that in his book, The Miracle of Forgiveness? I, I... Disagree with Spencer W. Kimball in his book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, but I do think he did a good job of explaining what the unique standard works say. He said, just do it. You're capable of doing it, then just do it. He said on on pages 163 and 164 of his book, trying is not sufficient, nor is repentance complete when one merely tries to abandon sin. To try is weak. To do the best you can is not strong. You must always do better than you can. This is true in every walk of life. I think Mormonism yeah. is impossible wow. for that. Wasn't it you or wow. Bill that I, I think I ran into at the temple and you were uh, handing out copies of the Miracle of Forgiveness? I have. I, I actually talk about that in our book, Sharing the Good News with Mormons. I have a website, themiracleofforgiveness.com. I have handed out, since 2014, over 1,400 copies uh, out on the streets and talking to people. Uh, I get into more conversations with that book. Some people really hate it because he does have a section against homosexuality. So there's a lot of the younger people who hate Mm -hmm. that. But many of them have not read it. But I find that the majority of the older Latter-day Saints have read it. And so I'll I'll stand outside uh, the general conference or a BYU football game, and I'll say, free copy of the Miracle of Forgiveness, every Latter-day Saint ought to read it. And then people will, with some pride, say, well, I've already read it. And then I ask that question. Oh, are you doing everything that Spencer W. Kimball said you're supposed to do? And then what do they say? Mm-hmm. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> I can't tell you how many, How did I memorize pages 163 and 164? The first year I was reading it, and after a while you just memorized it. And so I have it in my mind because 
Uh, Spencer W. Campbell was correct. If Mormonism is true, then trying is not enough. Mm. You need to keep the commandments of God. In fact, Spencer W. Campbell said on page, I think it's 209, that perfection is an achievable goal. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I think when I've talked with Mormons, just give me your thoughts. This verse has always come up when, say, we're doing outreach. Uh, Moroni 1032. Yep, I love that one. Uh, says, yea, come unto, and this is from the Book of Mormon. Mm-hmm. says, yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if you shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you. For you, that by his grace ye may be perfect in Christ, and if by the grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, ye can, na- ye can in no wise, deny, no wise deny the power of God. So I find what mm. I try and at least push the Mormon on is ask them, mm-hmm. uh, have you denied yourself of all ungodliness? Mm-hmm. And I point four fingers back at myself as I'm pointing. Uh, I haven't. Uh, so you, what about, have you loved God with all your might, mind, and strength? I haven't. Yeah. You realize it's if then. You can't get around it. And I think I've noticed, too, that as you have this conversation, they come to this weight and realization that I don't, like all of a sudden, like, oh my goodness, I'm there. And that's when you have to just tell them, at least from my perspective, that uh, you're under a, you're under a yoke. You're yeah. under a burden. Like, what, what's your experience in this? Have you used this verse, or what are your thoughts on that? Well, actually, uh, my friend Bill McKeever put together seven verses that he uses on the street. Uh, uh, we called it the celestial law tactic, and it was later made out um, by others. And so it's used a lot on the streets. That's one of the key verses. I think we need to make sure we have a lot of compassion for our LDS friends, family members, neighbors who are under the bond of the the yoke of of Mormonism. Because imagine, they are trying their best. They really are. And I commend them for trying hard, for doing their best. But if you're not capable of doing what what, uh, Mormonism says and what the scripture there in the the, uh, Book of Mormon says then you're not capable of being able to get to the celestial kingdom. The onus is on the back of the Latter-day Saint. If that's the case, they have no hope. Why is it here in Utah, one of the states that have the highest percentage of religious people? We have over 50% Latter-day Saints in this state. But Mm -hmm. we have one of the highest rates of Prozac usage Mm. in the entire nation. Why is that? Now, some might say the Rocky Mountains, you know, the, the mountains cause that. Well, really? Yeah, there's people, there's, there's doctors who say that that has an impact on depression. But I'm going to suggest to you, there are a lot of people who have manicured lawns, and every week, every Sunday, they open up their garage door with the remote control, and then they go in, and then it closes behind them. And, uh, and there's a lot of sadness there because they're doing their best. They're trying hard and they're not capable of doing everything they know they're supposed to do. I talk to people on the street Mm -hmm. all the time. That's why I think Spencer W. Kimball's book is not loved because he's just stating brass tacks and for them, that's not good news. And I would agree, but the Bible teaches that there is good news. There is hope. There is the possibility of knowing that you have a relationship with God, and it's not based on what you did or what you do. It's based on what God did. And that happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross, and he said, it is finished. You no longer have to do the work. Now he says, I have my work done. I have accomplished that. I have finished it. And he wants to, what we call imputation, he wants to credit us with righteousness that we do not have, uh, mm-hmm. th- that what we need, and that and that God can provide yeah. to us. Spencer W. Kimball said, "You have to be like a Superman. You have to basically keep all the law and be a Superman." I'm mm-hmm. going to say, "I do need a Superman, but it's not me. It's Jesus. Jesus is Amen. the one who paid yeah. the price and died for my sins, so that I might be able to have a relationship mm-hmm. with Him." And when you understand that concept, it changes you radically as far as what works are all about. Works Mm -hmm. are important, as chapter 9 in my book is about sanctification. Yes, we believe as Christians to do good works, but we don't believe those good works are somehow earning us God's favor. And that's what Mormons are 
not seen. So we need to have that compassion. We need to love Latter-day Saints. We need to be speaking the truth in love, Ephesians chapter 4. We need to have an answer for everyone who asks us to give the reason for the hope we have, but to do it with gentleness and respect. And I think that's what you guys do. I, I think If you hated Mormons, would you be doing cultish podcasts? No, we want to see no. them out of Mormonism and into Christ. And, and, and I think our motives are pure, even though Latter-day Saints think you must really hate me yeah. because you do this. This, this podcast is, is so negative toward the Mormon. Well, let me say there is bad news. Bad news is you're a sinner, and all the wages of sin is death. But there's a comma after that in Romans mm-hmm. six twenty three. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If somebody goes to their doctor and the doctor says, "Oh, you're doing just fine," and a year later you come back and you go, "I'm just not doing well," he says, "Well, yeah, last year I knew you had cancer. I just didn't want to ruin your day." Yeah. What kind of doctor would that be? Bad news is needs mm-hmm. to be delivered sometimes. Yes, you are going to hell if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, and yet. There is a, there's good news. The gospel means good news. Yeah. And Jesus is there in the Bible. You can read about him and you can receive him as your Lord and Savior. And that's my hope for every Latter-day Saint I talk to. Yeah, no, it's, it's, so, it's so important because when we talk about how bad theology hurts people or even just affects people, that you just see the culture in Utah is heavily affected by <clears throat> this works-based salvation so you talked about not it's not just Prozac. I mean, Utah leads the na- is one of the top leaders in the nation of all sorts of different type of prescription pills and and like Xanax and all all sorts, all sorts of different substance abuse. Really, a lot of the drugs used to be very mind numbing to numb how they feel. But also, it's one of the leading areas for uh, plastic surgery, yeah. pornography Pla- as well. Right. Yeah. And just because there's that pressure, that there's that sociological pressure from the women's perspective to have that perfect step for wives uh, look, and there's just more and more pressure, especially now, not only just that Mormon pressure, but then you have the Instagram influencer. Mm. Uh, I've talked with people who are ex Mormon and they felt they had so much pressure in that where it's like, I had is more than I could bear. So I think that's really, really big. Um, are there any other areas you've seen just with culture? Uh, within just Utah, your time here, where you kind of seen that practically played out, just the yoke and the burden that people have and how they carry that out? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, just talking to people on the streets, uh, you, I, I think you get that idea that uh, they really are good people as far as what what does good mean? It, it means that I'm a good neighbor. I, I mow my grass. I, I do nice things. And, and so at, at the same time, when I call them out on the doing everything, uh, I, I think you, they kind of lower their head and they just, uh, I think they easily uh, get discouraged. And, and I don't think it's necessary uh, to, to get discouraged when there is the answer. But unfortunately, mm-hmm. fewer than 2% of everybody who lives in Utah is an evangelical Christian. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need people coming here to, like you guys, you know, I mean, you, you've just moved here last year, Andrew, and we need more Christians here who are going to have the safety net available for people who are leaving this church in droves, and I think it's, I think it's unfathomable that only ten percent of everybody who leaves Mormonism ends up going to evangelical Christianity. That right. that number is too small, and that's why this mm-hmm. book, Introducing Christianity to Mormons, I want to give good information, a reminder for those who are Christians. But you know what? We don't teach theology very well mm-hmm. anymore. Back in the old days, it seemed like it was a little better. People don't read. People don't think very much. But we need to know what Christianity teaches. And then we need to also understand our Mormon friends and neighbors and their mindset so that we can give the best possible presentation of Christianity to them that they might have um, an an We have an answer, I think, mm-hmm. to, the prob- to, the, to the question of, where did we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? And I think it far supersedes anything that Mormonism has to offer. Mm. No, excellent. And I think one of my, this one chapter that popped out to me as well too, uh, as we kind of go towards, towards the tail end of our conversation here is that uh, growing in the faith, that there, there's just chapters in here that just seem, oh, well, this is kind of unconventional for a book. It's like a little different, but I think this is really good because it isn't just about helping someone leaving Mormonism. Even someone is helping them get out of Mormonism, get out of this cult, and we want them out of it and with Christ. But then even for someone who's LDS or any ex-cultist, 
there's a lot of there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of unthinking that they have to do. I mean, I'm sure I've had plenty of conversations with people who are ex LDS, even years later, still having struggling, knowing that they're saved by faith alone, but having that programming of that pressure from work still in their mindset. Practically, in this chapter, maybe maybe touch talk a little bit a little bit about that and what what drove you to write this chapter kind of towards the tail end. Yeah, as we said, chapter three, existence of God, chapter, I think it's seven, resurrection. Well, Mormons believe in the resurrection, but that is the cornerstone for what Christianity is all about. So I wrote that chapter. to I'm trying to be pro-Christian. And then I'm hoping that your LDS friend is not only asking, or maybe has just left the church, but they're not only asking what you believe, but, okay, so what do I do now? And that's how I start the chapter with... Uh, uh, a couple that were 80 years old. This is a true story. All the stories in there are true. And uh, uh, this was seven years ago. This 80-year-old couple came into the bookstore at Sandra Tanner's Utah Lighthouse Bookstore and said, uh, I don't believe Joseph Smith anymore. We've been in the church for 80 years. What do we do now? Well, what would you do if you got asked that question? What do you do now? Well, first thing is I think we need to talk about finding a church home where you can grow. Some would say you stay in the church. Maybe you can help people get out. No, I don't think that's a good idea. I think you need to find a, a good Christian church. Here in Utah, we have a website uh, sponsored by our ministry, mrm.org. It's called utahchurches.org, and we just bought utahchurches.com, Aaron Shapovalov. Oh, awesome. is the head of that one. So, so, uh, so that there's a place you can go find a church. Uh, I, I don't think you can live Christianity without the fellowship of the believers. The Bible says that it doesn't know of a Christian mm -hmm. who is not somebody who gets involved. So whether you go to Apologia, I go to the Mission, there's different good churches here in the Utah area or elsewhere outside. And so uh, hopefully a, a former Latter-day Saint has an evangelical Christian friend who would take them to church uh, to help guide them a little bit. And then uh, the, the chapter also deals with what are some other things that we do as part of the sanctification process to grow in our faith? Well, we better be in our Bibles. We need to learn how to study the Bible for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We can't just depend on the pastor. Uh, we, we need to learn how to pray. Uh, there, uh, so I, I try to go through some real basic things that a Christian could communicate. And I think if somebody does become a Christian, that you could read that chapter together with your friend and say, here are some of the things to consider. But I think if you get put into the right church in a local church body, not just watching it on TV, that people are going to know your name, that you actually can go to maybe some classes, Bible studies, get to know people. That's how we're going to grow is by having other people who are invested in us. And so as a, if you're a former Latter-day Saint and want to become a Christian, going to church doesn't make you a Christian, yeah. but going to church is going to help you become a better Christian. Mm. Yeah. And what do you think? Um, like as we're up, up here again, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm really hoping that this book uh, really kind of helps and, and reaches out to the people uh, that you wrote it for. Again, the book is called uh, introducing Christianity to Mormons and like long-term with, and we've talked about a broad variety of topics. We'll hold up here. All three of us, like as we wrap up, what would you say with everything that you wrote together? What would you like to see this book? I mean, if you could just sum up, okay, I spent a lot of time. This sums up multi decades of ministry, decades of, of just hundreds of conversations, reading materials, everything like that. But if you could just sum up, what do you think, what do you hope long-term this book does? What would that look like for you? I hope that Christians are challenged to share the Christian faith with their LDS friends. Certainly, I want them to get out of Mormonism. We need to understand the basics of Mormonism to help them get out. But once they've made that decision that Mormonism is no longer true, or they just want to understand what it is that you believe, I hope this book encourages you to be able to share what it is that we believe as Christians. Because if we have the truth, and I do believe we do, then um, we need to share that truth with Latter-day Saints in a way that they can understand. So this book, written specifically to help somebody explain Christianity to someone with the Mormon worldview. And in the last part, the glossary, I had to fight for this, by the way, with mm. my publisher, because they only want you to do so many pages. And mm. they said, oh, that's going to add pages. Yeah. Yeah. I said, I want to have a glossary 
that explains the terms that are used in this book. And I didn't want to have to explain it within the chapter. So I italicize the word whenever that first word is used. So you can come back here and look at it. But throughout, I actually take some of the terms that we have, uh, like for instance, grace. What does it grace mean to a Christian? Well, according to the Christian, it's unmerited favor with God. I only got one sentence. And so that's what I said, uh, provided to those who place their faith in Jesus, and LDS, enabling power provided by God to help a person keep the commandments. Completely different. So I'm hoping that this book could be like a resource that somebody could go, I'm not quite sure what my Mormon friend means when he says grace. Well, it's enabling power. Oh, enabling power to do what? To keep the commandments. And yet you ask them, are you doing it? No. So what good is grace if, hmm. if, it's, not, if it's not working? So, uh, yeah. that, so that's kind of a longer answer than you might have looked for, but I, I just hope that it's an equipper, and then I hope it's a book that Christians could feel free mm -hmm. to give to their LDS friend because I've written it as if a Mormon is reading this. So I try my best not to be uh, unnecessarily offensive, but I also want to share the truth. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, again, Introducing Christianity to Mormons, available now at on Amazon, christianbookstore.com, or wherever uh, this book, wherever it's available. We have links in our description as of right now. Uh, so if you guys enjoyed this episode, hope it was encouraging for you. And as always, uh, please leave comments on your social media. Let us know what you thought. And as always, a program like this cannot continue without your support. So if you want to support Cultish and allow programs like this to continue on a weekly basis, go to thecultishshow.com. There is a donate tab. You can become a monthly partner with us. Or if you want to drop us a one-time donation, that would be much appreciated. All right. All that being said, we will talk to you guys next week on Cultish, where we enter into the kingdom of the cults. Talk to you next week.